We have a, a pile of questions from Africa, but um, we can't ask them all. This is one question, though, that seems to be repeated because of the ongoing events uh, on the Ivory Coast. And uh, the questioner is, is asking on behalf of a university group, and he says, Mr. LaRouche, I wish you would somehow help us to understand how French military intervention in the Ivory Coast at this point is lawful. Why, in fact, is it being tolerated, regardless of whether people agree with him or not? Why is Laurent uh, Gabago and his family being handed over to their enemies? Why is it that the French who pounded his compound deny him the Geneva Conventions of Protection of War Prisoners? Uh, he seems to be completely unprotected by the Geneva War Prisoner Convention. Obviously, this is not a question which solely applies to the Ivory Coast or to this gentleman, but the reason why we ask it is because it does in fact seem that when it comes to Africa, no international law is respected either by the UN or by any member nation. Please respond. One has to understand that Africa is a colony of the British Empire. And uh, the idea that some other nations like France think they have some influence in that empire is nonsense. And the French, the empire in Africa, or the French empire in Africa was the, uh, developed largely by a British agent called Antecedent Mitterrand, Napoleon III. This, this system developed that system. That was where the French army the empire really developed. And to the present day, remember that the submission of France, which was organized by the Duke of Wellington as the occupying power, the France was supposed to be uh, liberated uh, uh, from Napoleon with the appointment of a uh, Lazare Carnot as president of France. A Lazare Carnot's position was eliminated by British orders, the Duke of Wellington's in particular, and uh, the, pretty much the uh, Ecole Polytechnique, while it still functioned, no longer had the central patriotic authority. It had the mission, but not the authority, of a scientific institution. So the Ecole Polytechnique continued to be a very valuable institution in world history of science, though somewhat diminished in power relative to what it had been earlier. And whereas uh, the great, uh, great leaders, political leaders of this thing, especially Lazare Carnot, were booted out of France and bounced around to a number of places where he died in Germany under the protection of the friends of, uh, our, shall we say, our friends in Germany, the friends of Schiller. And he functioned there in, uh, as a uh, teacher, as a researcher, as an educator. And he was uh, buried with great honors as a with his rank of major general of the uh, of the French forces, and all so by the by the government of Germany, and when he had died, his uh, nephew became the president of France, and you had a German military force organized to escort the coffin to the borders of France, and then a French military force assumed responsibility and carried him to his interment in Paris. So you had, uh, that France was put aside. In recent times, in my experience, despite my disagreement with what some of the things that Charles de Gaulle did earlier as the president of the, of the Fifth Republic, his, his work was essentially constant, one of constant improvement and achievement. And it was only the assassination of uh, Kennedy which enabled him to be, in a sense, degraded in influence. My experience with de Gaulle personally was, came after his death in my enterprises in France, where I had a great number of friends among the uh, French veterans of the de Gaulle party, de Gaulle faction. And, uh, also acquainted with Mitterrand, who was a British agent, as the British told me in London. 
informally, and we had a little discussion about this matter. So the representative of the British Foreign Office uh, told me th that they were for Mitterrand, not de Gaulle. And I, was, I suggested that de Gaulle was the proper reference point. And since that time, uh, since the death of de Gaulle, there has been a paucity of uh, ability in France to select a president or leading institution which is capable of efficiently governing the, the joint. Generally to the present day, France, while it likes to pretend that it's very independent, uh, understandable, emotional thought, but uh, it's not independent. It is actually a puppet, largely, of the British Empire. And so therefore, when you take this into account, and you take the account of Belgium and so forth, these other nominal colonial powers in Africa, the sum total is that Africa is entirely a British colony. And nobody moves in Africa, generally without British thing. Take the case of Sudan, the targeting of Sudan by the British, hmm? by the same man who was a young fellow, shipped Jews off to uh, the concentration camps. Hmm? Soros uh, is uh, a power in Britain, a criminal by intention. Criminal by character. So the, the, you, and he's the, one of the leaders of the attack on Sudan today. Sudan was too damn independent for British taste. They always hated it because they had their uh, little fellow that they, the Sudanese killed, you know, Chinese Gordon. And he was killed. I saw the place where he died in a very shameful way. But anyway, and they've never forgiven Sudan for Chinese Gordon who was a nasty fellow. So in Africa, the problem is that the British Empire treats Africa with US consent as a British colony. And they treat Africans as if they were slaves or cattle or worse. They are concerned to manage the population of Africa murderously. Every British leader is potentially ready for a Nuremberg trial on the basis of what they've done in Africa and are continuing to do. Soros, particularly. Soros is the man who, as a youth, got a job hiding his Jewish identity and giving people their travel notices to the death camps. And he is now a leading British official involved in the affairs of the United States, involved in the affairs of Europe. And he has not improved by any means what he was when he was passing out travel notices to Jews sent, being sent to destruction. And that's the kind of problem we have to understand. This, we have to get rid of the British Empire. The problem of saving Africa is, is just exactly that nature. We know that if we do what we can do well, with the reorganization of the United States and Eurasia, what we can do with Africa by putting in high-speed rail systems and power systems, nuclear power systems and so forth, into Africa, we can create a system of infrastructure in Africa which has many rich resources, under which Africa can tap its own rich resources and begin to introduce industries which are based on a platform, agriculture and industry. Africa is one of the great food growing areas of the world today. With this kind of development, Africa can become the food source of food for much of humanity. It needs a transportation system, it needs sanitation, it needs a power system. It needs freedom, because without freedom, people cannot develop freely, cannot develop the technologies. But if we, if we act to crush the British Empire and its puppets and fellow travelers, and act to provide Africa with the development of the essential infrastructure it requires, like this idea of rebuilding the water system huh? in, in, uh, in, in Africa. That thing in itself will make Africa a jewel of future generations. 
but you have to get rid of the British Empire first, or it won't happen.